the Boston Mass. Jose Raymond, since turning pro in 2007, has competed in over 32 contests, winning 10 IFBB Pro Shows, including the prestigious Arnold Classic in 2015. He's joining us here on the Physique Business Podcast to talk about making money and kicking ass. Welcome to the Physique Business Podcast, making money in the fitness industry. You've spent hours in the gym, sweating buckets, crushing PRs, and lifting a ton of weight. Now it's time to turn that passion into a highly profitable business. Here's stories and tips of proven methods for starting and scaling your business in the fitness industry. And now your host, Corey Sweargoss. Please allow me to introduce the Boston Mass, Jose Raymond, to the show. How you doing, Jose? I'm fabulous, buddy. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I really appreciate it. I know you're a super busy guy and uh, you're getting ready for the Olympia. Do you have any uh, predictions of uh, who's going to take home the crown? Oh, um, I've been doing this all week. <laughs> okay. um, I would pretty much say as much as I love Brandon, I think it's going to be a Phil and Brandon show. And I think Phil is coming back um, just ridiculous and to an unbeatable level unless Ronnie Coleman came back at his best. That's about all that's going to be able to beat Phil right now. Um, and I do think that, that Brandon is going to be the best that he's ever been. But that just tells you how genetically gifted Phil is. And uh, I think we'll see Phil win convincingly. Awesome. And what about, uh, real quick, what about 212? Who's going to take that title? That, I believe, is going to be Kamal again. Kamal has improved. He's bigger. Just as hard as, as last year, he's polished. All the things that helped him win as a smaller guy uh, are gonna help him win again as a slightly bigger guy. I think he's gonna be five, six, seven pounds bigger this year. And, um, you know, but I think the surprise of the show will be George Peterson coming from classic physique to push Kamal very hard. It, you know, I bet a lot of people are going to say George should have won and he very well may win. But, um, you know, th those are my top two. And then three and four could could go any which way, I think, with the between Sean Clarita and Derek um, Lunsford. And then it's just a crazy. The top 10 in the 212 is going to be so competitive that any one of these guys, you know, you're going to have Ashkenani who's been a top three guy multiple times, David Henry, a former winner, um, who, if he's at his best, who could win this show, you know? Um, the guy that was fourth place last year, John Jewett, he's, you know, you can't just push him out of there. He beat Ashkenani and Henry last year. Um, the guy, Bo Lewis, Jason Lowe, um, it just, go, this, that small guy from, from Spain, Angel Calderon, He's a freak. He won four shows since the Olympia last year. Crazy. Um, crazy. There's a lot of talent in there. Nice. Well, the cool thing was by the time this actually airs, we're going to know the results. So we'll know exactly uh, how accurate you were. <laughs> yeah, perfect. But uh, let's really talk, pretty close. Let's, let's talk about a uh, five foot four bodybuilder from Massachusetts. And how did you get into bodybuilding and how this whole crazy career start for you? Well, like a lot of people, I started for um more of the mental aspects of it um my older brother he's almost six years older than me he started training and, and we were both adopted by the same family so we got to grow up together and we had some um social anxiety so social issues back in the you know late 70s early 80s there was still a little bit of um race we grew up in a really affluent area and we would dark with curly kinky hair in the summer and you know we didn't really fit in and, and and you know we we took to weights to kind of be like a stress relief and we both played sports and and you know we excelled uh, um very well in sports and and the weights kind of was a way to get better in in football wrestling and and it also was a great stress relief but then we started growing and we were bigger than everyone in town. So my brother convinced me to do a show at 18. I won 
and it was a huge show. Back then, there was only one show. It was called the New Englands, and everyone from New England came and did it. And so, you know, there was over a thousand fans, and it was a big deal. And I won, and I was completely addicted to that feeling of, of winning a show, of doing it all myself, not depending on a teammate or anyone else. Uh, and, and from that point forward, I knew what I was born to do, you know. So it didn't have to do anything to do with women whatsoever? Not at all. Um, that was just a, a, a bonus in the uh, life of a, of a bodybuilder. Gotcha. Um, yeah, no, I didn't. In fact, it kept me away from women because I wasn't out clubbing and partying. You know, when all my friends were doing that, I would, uh, I'd be in doing cardio, uh, getting rest, doing whatever it is I had to do. And, uh, you know, it made me, I was never a club guy where I was out hooking up with chicks. I, I always had a girlfriend. So it, it was, um, kept me away from girls, if anything. Gotcha. So I guess the, uh, the slogan, more plates, more dates, isn't true in the life of the Boston Mass. No, not for me, but uh, it certainly could have been if, if I wanted to utilize it in that manner. Um, you know, we didn't have Tinder and, and, and dating apps back then. You know, when I first started, that wasn't what I was in it for. For sure. So when did you realize that you could actually make this a career and actually start making money and make a living, you know, within the bodybuilding, you know, community and being a professional bodybuilder? Um, I didn't until I did. Um, which means like my older brother was making money because he was this gorgeous model type, you know, and, and I certainly wasn't. And he was making money to do photo shoots, be on covers. And that just wasn't my look or my style. You know, um, I wanted to be a beast. I wanted to be the guys in, in flex mag, muscle mag, muscle development and be, you know, just gnarly looking. Um, but once I turned pro and I was getting these photo shoots and then I would, you know, was getting sponsorships. I, I didn't realize that I could until I actually signed a deal. And, and I, I realized my value to these companies and, uh, and that I was, you know, I, I wasn't in it for that. It was kind of weird. I just, I wanted to have something that I absolutely loved to do. If I made money at it, great. Um, but that wasn't my motivation. I, I wanted to be the best at what I did at whatever that is. And, um, you know, to me back then it was to be the best natural bodybuilder in the country, if not the world. But so did, did you turn pro naturally? Yeah. Multiple times, okay. every time. Nice. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, you know, make that decision until after my first pro show. When I, when I did the New York pro, I was 184 pounds and there, there were guys that I just know I, I should be beating. And, and I didn't beat them. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to play, I might as well play by the rules. And, uh, you know, that's when I, I decided to up my game. And three months later, I beat almost all those guys uh, 18 pounds heavier on stage in three months. And I qualified for my first Olympia, where I was in the first call out at the Olympia. And um, yeah, that was that was um, a change. There, a lot went on between me being uh, um, obsessed with being the best natural bodybuilder and then deciding to go otherwise, you know, um, gotcha. a lot happened. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you know, you alluded to your brother, Tito, you know, obviously moving out to California, um, you know, you decided to stay back in Boston. Um, was that a hard transition to see your brother go away? Cause you guys grew up so close together. Um, you know, and what, you know, looking back, would you have had it any other way? Do you, do you regret not moving out to the West coast and being closer to him? Well, I, I regret not being closer to him for sure. I miss him every day. Um, but we have a, a, a different type of relationship where it was more like father son uh, than it was brothers. You know, he, he took it upon himself to, to raise me and to um, do all the little things that a father does, spend extra time with me at night, you know, talking to me and, and, 
you know, giving me his clothes. If he had one bite left of his food, he'd give it to me. And, and all the things that a father does for a son. My first cell phone, he bought for me. My, back then we had pagers. He bought me my first pager. He bought me my first pair of Jordans. He, you know, anything I ever got in my life was from him. And, you know, I was 22 years old, just graduated college. I had student loans that were due immediately. And he wanted to move to LA. And he's like, yeah, we're moving. And I, I told him last minute that I wasn't actually going to move because I needed to make money immediately. And when he left, I just took over all his clients. So I had a fully booked schedule right out of college, you know, making good money. Nice. So that would be stupid to turn that down and just in hopes of making it out in LA. Mm -hmm. And I had sort of a uh, chip on my shoulder back then. I didn't like all the fake people in LA. You know, everyone's trying to be someone they're not. You know, they're, they're, they'll call themselves an actor, but they're really a waitress. You know, or they're really a, a wannabe personal trainer, you know. Yeah. There was so much of that when I visited. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm not going to miss that. So, you know, I took it upon myself to let my brother, he was 28. He was at the, you know, he was exploding. And he needed to be out in L.A. He needed to be where the photographers were and uh, where that lifestyle was. And he wasn't going to blossom into what he could be if he was constantly looking over his shoulder at what I'm doing, yeah. you know, and, and I couldn't become a man if my older brother's watching my every move. So I made, it was a tough decision, um, but it needed to be made and he wasn't going to make it. So yeah. I just, you know, every year we'd be like, yeah, yeah. Next year you move out here next year. And, and um, you know, we kind of lived with that dream of me eventually going out there but you know i grew older and bought property bought a home bought you know yeah. got my my own life here you know um so it's been good but yeah i miss them every day we talk every day um but it's clearly not the same as if we were there together you know do you think the trajectory of your career would have changed if you had moved to california or do you think your hard work and dedication got you you know everywhere you wanted to be well, um, no, I'm, I'm not where I want to be, um, but I, I think it would have been a little different because my brother was the one who instilled the whole natural bodybuilding thing. And um, that was a tough decision. I was 34 years old when I decided that I was going to, you know, go for broke and be a professional bodybuilder. And, you know, had I been spending more time with him, I might not have uh, made that decision. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, but I think I made the right decision in staying where I was and, and trying to grow. I think my work ethic, when I'm focused on a goal, it doesn't matter if I'm in LA or Boston or where I'm at, I, I'll, I, would, I would have gotten it done. But um, I needed a bit of freedom for me to grow as a person and to make decisions on my own. And, you know, when I had that discussion with my brother, he, he respected it. He said, you know, it, it's an educated, informed decision. You're, you're a man, you're not a kid. You do what you gotta do, just be careful. You know, the first time he seen me afterwards, he almost cried. He was like, oh, oh my God, dude, what the fuck? Like he, I was 240 pounds, yeah, yeah. you know, and he was always, bigger than me you know when we were coming up he was always 185 pounds and i was 165 um but now i was 50 60 pounds bigger than him yeah and uh <laughs> he was just like you know make sure you're healthy make sure you know always just worried about my health and, and um you know rightfully so but i've always kept kept myself in check for sure um, well, you know, kind of keep it in line with the physique business podcast. Like how does a bodybuilder actually make a living? Well, it depends on who you ask, you know, the, with modern day social media, there's so many different outlets and avenues for you to make money. You know, it was, but when I was coming up, it was mostly just magazine contracts and supplement contracts. And to me, that was better because only the good survived. 
only the really top guys were getting paid and they were getting paid well because the money wasn't being spread out amongst ambassadors and guys that are doing it for free protein shakes and stuff. Um, it was just only the best. So if you won, you got paid. Yeah. And I like that, you know, that, that's what inspired me, you know, that made me work hard to only the, only the tough survived there. Um, and now, you know, there's guys that I would smoke in a show that are making 10 times what I make because they know how to post and they know the algorithms and they know when to post and what to post. And I, that's just not me. I don't know. My social media sucks. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have like 148,000 followers on Instagram and I barely post. Yeah. I just, I, I, I don't know that that's not my cup of tea. I try to stay up with it. I, I love doing interviews and, and uh, uh, reaching out to, to the fan base and, and, talking and, and, and letting people know who I am, but just to post a stupid picture with a motivational quote or a Bible verse is complete garbage to me. You know, I don't get it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I did very well when it was when you win money, you know, yeah. if you're one of the best, you're going to be recognized as such and you'll have supplement contracts and you'll have magazine contracts and you'll get guest appearances and um you know you'll get to interact with people yeah. a lot of these people that are great at social media they're great on their computer they're great at home they may not be great to interview or even talk and, and put them out in front of a crowd of people and are they are they actually worth all that money to talk to people for sure mm -hmm. i remember you telling me a story that uh when you had a supplement uh, sponsorship i believe it was muscle tech and they paid you a bonus for every first place that you uh, or every show that you won. Yeah. Um, does, does that even exist today? Or is that kind of a thing of the past now with, with supplement sponsorship? Well, I, I went on to write that into my contracts of every contract that I had because, you know, they're like, well, you're just a 212 guy. So we're not going to pay you what we're paying Roly, or we're not going to pay you what we're paying Brandon or an open guy. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well then you, you got to pay me for wins, you know? So I would get paid for top three, you know, whether it be 10,000 for winning 7,500 for second or 5,000 for third, you know, depending on what the competition was. Yeah. Um, so I would write that in, I, I'm not sure what the contracts look like today because there's so very few of them. You know, the, there's really not many supplement contracts. You look across the board, they're all starting their own companies because there there aren't any contracts anymore. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, back then, I do believe there was a uh, bonus built into the contracts for, for most guys, because yeah. that would be a way for a company to say, well, we're not going to pay you 150 grand up front in your salary but you have an opportunity to make that much if you win. And, and that would be them hoping that you're great at marketing, great at social media, but shit on stage. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and that's what ended up happening. I, I won two shows in an eight day span and Muscle Tech owed me big time bonuses. <laughs> they paid me, nice. but they also fired me at the same time. Yeah. They were like, well, you know, here's your money, but we'll no longer be requiring your services. That's and uh, yeah, it was kind of dumb because they could have just offered me a contract that would equal that money and they would have gotten their money's worth. Totally. Is that what played into your, uh, your rationale to compete in as many shows as you did? Because I think you've been one of the most active guys since you turned pro. Yeah. yeah, that's initially what did make me because part of my contract was you get no money unless you win, but we'll pay for all your shows. So while I was with them, I did 11 shows in a two year period, Amazing. which is a lot. For sure. And uh, they paid for every single one of them. And, um, you know, I certainly got my money's worth out of them. And, you know, I realized a long time ago that you don't get better at something by not doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be better at competing, then compete, get out there as much as you can, you know, master your craft of the, 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 the prep, the 16 week prep, 20 week prep, master the last month, four weeks, 
to two weeks to 10 days, you know, you got to be able to master exactly what your body is doing all the way up to the show and, and how to make changes uh, if necessary, and, you know, and how to be 100% ready under all conditions. Now, you're not always going to be in your hometown. You're not always going to be in Vegas. You might be in Romania. You might be in Vancouver. You, you might be, you know, in, in Japan, Korea. How do you prepare to be at your best when you got to fly 18 hours to Korea? Yeah. You know, so I mastered all those things. I was never nervous. I knew I would plan it out in my head weeks ahead of time. I would prepare everything in my luggage, whether, you know, I'd freeze my food and put it on my checked luggage. So by the time I landed, it was just starting to unthaw. I'd put it in the fridge right away. Um, you know, there were all these little tricks that I did to make sure that I would be ready. Nice, nice. You know? Yeah, I, I still remember the first time that I met you, you know, met you at the Vancouver International Airport and you came yeah. out here for a 14 day trip and we toured across yeah. the province. Um, you know, crazy thing. I mean, you could have bitched, you could have moaned, you could have, you know, called home to, you know, your supplement company and, and you know, like saying, hey, you sent me with this 25 year old kid. He doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> no, you were great. So, <laughs> so quick story, hold on. We, we just got two feet of snow. I literally minutes ago just came in before this podcast and I was wearing the gas jacket that you met me at the airport with. Nice, nice. I swear to God, I wear that. That's my winter jacket. Yeah. The thing's so heavy. Yeah. Amazing. No, it was, it was incredible. Obviously, you know, you came in, you, you probably flown for, I don't know, at least 12 hours. We jump, in, we jump in a big ass suburban, get on the ferry, take that across, head over to Nanaimo, drive up to Campbell river. You're probably awake. Yeah. For, I don't know, 24, 26, 28 hours. And we're just doing, do you this remember thing. what I asked you? Yeah, <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> I, what did I say? Are we in the North pole? Oh, we gotta be close, right? And then, yeah, and then you actually asked for an Eskimo, and I actually delivered you an Eskimo. So. Yeah, you did. <laughs> well, you were the best host I've ever had. Oh, amazing. But I was so confused because I had to fly from Boston to Minneapolis, Minneapolis to Seattle, then Seattle to Vancouver, some crazy shit. Yeah, yeah. And then we drove at least six hours. Yeah. And, I mean, by the time I had realized what I was doing, I was literally awake for 24 hours or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I was convinced we were somewhere where there'd be Eskimos and, and, and little uh, penguins and shit. <laughs> I wasn't too far off. <laughs> yeah. No, that was, yeah, pretty, you know what, you know what, you look back and it's like, those, I, to me, those are the things that you remember. And yeah. you're thankful for those opportunities. I mean, it's really the, you know, the crazy stuff that, that you remember more than, you know, any financial gain or the money you were paid to be here or, 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 or any of that stuff, really. Oh, yeah. I was, I felt like a rock star. You guys had um, closed down a movie theater for me. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and there was only like eight of us and we got to watch the, uh, what was that movie called? Generation, Not Pumping Iron. Generation, Generation Iron. Generation Iron. Yeah, yeah. And that was so cool. Yeah. And I was late to my own movie. <laughs> true, how cool fashion, is that true, jose fashion never shows up on time <laughs> no no i, I Puerto well, Rico. we had finished the workout right yeah yeah exactly exactly no that that's awesome man um what do you th i mean is it safe to say the arnold classic win was the the greatest moment in your career or is there or another moment that really stands out to you so there's there's a few but you know yeah um financially and uh as far as clout you know you know i won the arnold classic receiving the trophy from arnold in front of the world you know it was broadcast everywhere it was jam-packed with fans and you know it doesn't get much better than getting a trophy from arnold himself for sure um but that was kind of a whirlwind like my my career just hit a a rocket ship and it happened so fast that i didn't really 
absorb it and take it all in. Uh, I was just on to the next one. Like, what's the next thing? Where back when I was competing in the amateurs, I did the team universe, which is now the universe, mm -hmm. um, seven years in a row because it was my goal to win the universe and go to the world championships and win the world championships. So back then it was so difficult to win that show because everyone who's anyone, especially in the lighter weight divisions was doing it. I mean, in that show, we had Kai Green, Sean Roden, me, my brother, Derek Fonzer, Tricky Jackson, uh, Chris Faldo, it, some names, legendary names in that one show. Mm -hmm. So when I finally won that, that was probably the most rewarding uh, uh, win of my career. And, and I was only 165 pounds. And it was just because of the importance to me. I didn't make a penny. Yeah. Um, and, and it was just that I'd worked so hard seven years in a row and I finally won it. That meant the most to me. Yeah. But, um, you know, and you could argue that, you know, winning the Arnold was great um, and it meant a lot, but what, six months later, I was on stage pushing Flex Lewis for everything he had. Yeah. And you had a crowd filled with people that were like, Ooh, you know, it was, it was flip a coin. I was, you know, was there. That, yeah, and that to me meant even more than winning the Arnold because, you know, I won the Arnold, but the number one guy wasn't there. You know, when you're just about to beat the number one guy in the world, there was no question in anyone's mind that those were the top two bodybuilders in the world at that time on that stage. And, you know, that to me was kind of the, the real pinnacle. Yeah. I didn't win it but I very well could have, sure. and nobody would have argued. And, and that, that meant more to me, knowing that I was at the pinnacle of my sport at that very moment. And, you know, you can never take that away from me, Absolutely. even though I didn't win. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think when you left the, the Arnold Classic in Columbus, did you go to Australia and then New Zealand right after? Yes, yes. But I, I didn't compete in New Zealand that, that year. Okay. So I won the New Zealand Pro in 14 and 16. And I, 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 I um, competed in it. I didn't compete in 15 because they didn't have it. Gotcha. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. No, I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it's definitely a testament to you. I know, um, I know the, on the Arnold Classic Sports page, it says you've competed in 32 shows in your life. It's probably... Yeah. It probably didn't uh, capture all of your pro shows, but um, I've heard rumblings that you got a bit of uh, an itch to potentially come back in 2021 and, and hit the stage again. Well, I mean, anyone who's done it, particularly someone who's done it for this amount of time in my life, I've been competing more than half of my life, you know, at 18 years old. And, you know, I still feel healthy enough and strong enough to be able to do battle with these guys. Um, so yeah, there's always that possibility. I haven't made a hundred percent commitment to doing anything, um, but I will in the next four or five months for sure. Um, it's just because I, I love it so much. I love what it does for me mentally as far as the uh, every other aspect of my life. Yeah. You know, I'm more productive, I'm more focused. I'm more, I got my shit together much more when I have a goal to focus on. If I'm just left to my own devices to, 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 to go about life, then I don't feel as motivated and inspired. Um, and I'm still young enough. I'm still, I don't want to look back and say I should have tried it, For sure. you know? So the, I'm definitely leaning more towards doing it than not doing it. That's for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. We'll certainly be here to, to cheer you on, man. You know, I've always been one of your biggest fans and supporters along the way. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Do you, have, do you have any advice that you would give a young aspiring bodybuilder who's, you know, about to turn pro or just turns pro um, in regards to what they should be doing to be able to have a sustained and, you know, honestly profitable career as a bodybuilder? 
Well, number one, be patient. Um, this sport, I mean, I see, you do see a lot of 24, 25 year old physiques that look unbelievable, but that's rare. That's very rare. Um, you, you need to be patient and let your body grow into what it's meant to be. You can't force it with drugs or more drugs or all different types of drugs, you know? And that's become a problem is people think, well, you want that, there's a drug for that. You want this, there's a drug for this, you know? That's not the case. Your body needs time under the bar, you know? It needs time training and getting better and, and just be patient. Um, the, the other thing is what we spoke about earlier, get out there and compete more, get your face out there. Um, the, the people aren't gonna see you if you're sitting at home. You know, if you're taking this year off to get better, uh, well, the, you can only get so much out of Instagram photos. We need you on stage promoting the sport, out doing the, 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 the business of bodybuilding. You know, and that was something I prided myself on was doing as many shows as possible, interacting with as many people as possible and showing up at your best as often as possible. You know, and that, that's kind of how you'll gain fans and gain respect within the industry is if you go out and you do it, because you're not just doing it for yourself. If you're showing up on point all the time, then you're promoting the industry. You're promoting the IFBB bodybuilding as a whole, because you know, you're, they're able to point at you and say, look at the quality we have. These guys show up every time in shape. They show up and put on a great show every time. So you, know, you gotta take pride in what you're doing and, and show up at your best every, every chance you can. And uh, you know, that's the most important thing, get out there. If you have an opportunity to guest pose, or do an appearance, don't not do it because the guy won't give you 3,500. He's only giving you 3,000. Mm -hmm. You know, they're gonna pay for your flight, your hotel, your food. They're gonna give you some money, but they're giving you an opportunity is what they're giving you. Take advantage of as many opportunities you can to travel and meet all the fans across the world because it may open up another opportunity. You know, I've been to another country where I've met another promoter and they're like, well, I put on a show down in Trinidad. Would you like to come down and do that? Hell yeah. Stay in touch. You know, and that's how you do it. And you get to see the world. I've been to every country imaginable yeah. and never paid for it myself. Nice. And, you know, that's priceless in, in, its, in itself right there. I've gotten to see the world, meet different people. And I never squabbled about money, really. I mean, unless it was a disrespectful offer. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as you're covering what I would have made staying at home and I get a free trip out of it, hell yeah, I would do it. You know, I don't call myself the best businessman, but as long as I can make sense of it, you know, because I'm a trainer at home and I might have, you know, four or five appointments on a Friday, uh, on Saturday and Sunday. So, as long as you can cover what I would have made staying home and I get a trip out of it, hell yeah, I'll go. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of value in saying yes. And, you know, as you alluded to before, you're saying you're not the best at social media. I think you getting out there and meeting those fans and building those people are, you know, the 140,000 people that, that follow you and interact with you on, on, on Instagram. I'd almost be willing to bet that you probably have met more of your following on Instagram than 99% of the other, you know, professional bodybuilders out there. A hundred percent. And I agree with you. And in that I, I've done some digging and I look at people who have, you know, say 500,000 followers, but then they only get like 18 comments on a post, Yeah. you know, where I have 148,000 and I'll get 300 comments or I post a quick video and it gets 50,000 views or something. Yeah. There's way more personal interaction within my page. And that makes more sense to me. I, I, um, value that more than having a million followers that I have no clue who they are. And some of them, quite frankly, have no clue who I am. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you get, how did you uh, amass, you know, um, a popularity with the, you know, kind of in Central America, South America, it's always kind of, 
intrigued me how you were able to penetrate that market and almost be uh, you know, a superstar down there. You know, it's funny because uh, I speak very little Spanish, but I am 100% Puerto Rican and you hear the name Jose and that resonates everywhere, you know, Mexico, um, all throughout South America, even Brazil, Jose. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I've managed to hit that market um, unknowingly, you know, and because a lot of the magazines have like an MD Latino and I, I actually got in good with Kit, Kit Anderson who was, was the editor for them. And so he would do a lot of interviews with me and, um, you know, obviously do the translation. But I think, you know, having a smaller stature where most South American uh, or Latinos have a smaller stature, it, it gave them uh, something to look at and aspire to, you know, because you're not gonna have too many six foot tall Mexicans that are, uh, you know, bodybuilders. So most of them are gonna be my height, shorter or within a few inches of my height. Yeah. And it gives them something to look towards. In, in, you know, I was in magazines, I was in tons of videos, I was on the Olympia stage. So I was doing legit stuff. And, and you know, it, it made them believe and, and realize, wow, if you can do that, I certainly am capable of doing that. So I think that's how it happened. And I did a few trips to Mexico and it was wild. You know, lines wrapped around the building for people to come and meet me. And, and awesome. I never, in a million years imagine something like that you know um and even though i spoke very little fluent spanish i was still able to interact with them mm -hmm. and, and it was so cool you, you know whether you had um translators or just being able to you know they come up and give me a hug and, and take pictures and just be friendly the international language of love and, and they all brought it and felt it and you know, I'll forever cherish those moments for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. I think that, you know, I think that's really cru crucially important where even if you can't speak the language, you can still connect with people and leave them with a, you know, a lasting memory, you know, about actually being present. I think that's one of the worst things in the world now, especially when you see people, um, you know, or even see bodybuilders and they're on their phones. They don't want to put the phone down or like or where they're not engaged with, with their audience and the people that are there. And, you know, the thing is, like, if you don't interact with that person and you don't take them as being serious, like it can actually work in reverse as well, where you could have gained a fan, but you actually just gained a hater if you didn't give them, you know, that 20 seconds of your time, you know, to take a yeah. them or, or anything like that. So something I learned a long time ago, and I would give Jay Cutler credit for this, is that if you ever go to um, like meet the Olympians at the Olympia or you go to a big expo, and 90% of the bodybuilders are behind a table and all their eight by tens are strewn out and their t-shirts and DVDs or whatever. And they're behind the table. Yeah. And every time I did, did an appearance, I would stand in front of the table mm -hmm. so I could shake their hand, give them a hug, take a picture with them right away. And that's a huge difference. Huge difference Absolutely. between standing behind the table, having three feet between you and the person and actually standing out in front. You know, selling my merchandise was secondary mm -hmm. to meeting and selling myself. Totally. You know, I, I would make sure that I could interact up close and personal with every person that waited in line to meet me. Like to me, it was bizarre to think, oh, my God, these people are waiting 20, 30, 40 minutes to meet me and I'm going to stand behind a table. No way. Yeah, yeah. So I always, and, and, and Jay was very much like that. And I always watched Jay and how he interacted and he was never behind a booth, never behind a table. He'd make sure that he was up front. And, and that was something that I advise other people, you know, later on in my career when they, you know, they would ask, you know, how, how, how are you so cool with all these people? And, and you know how many people that I come up to and will remember me from years ago and I'll remember their name and they're blown away, you know, it, because I got to have a close personal interaction with them, whether they hand me the baby to take a picture with or 
you know, we would talk about my dog or we would talk about different things. You know, it, it meant the world to them and it means the world to me. So, I mean, that's another piece of advice I would give to a younger person coming up. If you interact with people, then truly interact with them. Don't stand behind a booth mm -hmm. and, and, you know, reach your hand across the table where they have to look at your merchandise. That's kind of cheesy. If someone wants something and they want a t-shirt or something, they're going to ask you anyway. You, you don't have to stand behind it and make them look at it. Totally. So, totally. Yeah. Awesome. You know what? I really appreciate you doing this. Um, you know, I wish you all the very best and uh, I hope you have a, you know, a great rise back up in uh, 2021 and uh, really appreciate everything you do, man. Yeah, me too, Corey. I really appreciate everything you've done for me through the years and uh, we've always stayed in touch. And I, I really like that about you is, you know, you don't forget people and uh, congratulations on your new show coming up. And what's the date? Is there anything, any way I can help you? You let me know. Sure. I'll help you promote it from here. And I'd love to come up and witness it. I know you're not having a 212 division, unfortunately, but uh, oh, yeah, if yeah. there was, I'd come up and do it. Yeah, so the date's uh, June 26th, uh, 2021 in Victoria. And uh, so we're launching with uh, women's bodybuilding and women's physique this year. And we'll just, we'll, awesome. see, we'll see where it goes. You know what, we wanted to start out just with a, a manageable event that we can continue to grow and have it sustainable. Um, and you know, I'm really actually really excited to put the women front and center. Um, you know, a lot of the eyes, a lot of the attention has always been on, uh, you know, men's bodybuilding and men's open bodybuilding and really to have a platform for women's bodybuilding and, and women of muscle and feminine muscle to really be put on the forefront. So I'll definitely keep in touch with you, you know, with that as it gets closer. And, and I appreciate everything that you're doing, you know, for the sport. And, and hopefully one day we can add 212 to it and, and have you up here. Awesome. Yeah. You let me know any way I can help. Yeah. I look forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, I really appreciate it. I think we're obviously we're, we're done here now, but uh, you know, I hope you have an awesome Christmas. I hope you are, are staying safe and, and, and healthy and you recover and get back training there pretty soon. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I'm taking the holidays off and then I'm going full bore come the new year. Nice. Nice. Did that so, the break your heart this year, taking a step backwards and not. Uh, yeah. Oh. But at least I get Tom Brady down in Tampa Bay, yeah. Tom and, and Gronkowski. It's yeah. still exciting for me. Yeah. Sure. Well, you know what? You can never complain because I think you have kids who grew up in Boston and have never known what it's like to lose. So yeah, exactly. You can ever complain. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not a complainer. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. Really appreciate it, dude. Um, yeah. Let's just keep in touch. And uh, this episode will probably launch uh, January 12th, I believe. Um, we're going to launch three episodes to start. So, so you'll be part of the, all the promotional. If you can send me one or two images that you okay. want to use to, to kind of promote the show and stuff, um, that would be wicked. And uh, all right. get all that stuff done up for you. And uh, we'll just, we'll just keep it rolling. All right, brother. You got it. Thanks again. Appreciate and good it. luck with everything. We'll talk soon. Yeah, was this interview painful or, or how was it overall? It was great. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> easy, you're easy to talk to. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> yeah. All right, buddy, have a good one. Thanks, man. All right, you too. Bye-bye.